Hello, Bama friends. It's great to be with you again. And it was so great to be with you last week in person, in the room. Um, so many churches like you guys are, are getting back to live services. Um, for those of you, for those of you who thought, you know, like pajamas and coffee on the couch, like you've gotten really accustomed to that. Well, last week, I got to see so many of your friends and your church family, and I didn't get to see you. This is what's so great, right? Like you never know what's gonna happen in the room. Like we're in this time for churches where we can think differently and do things differently. And it just, it made my heart feel so great to be with so many um, of you that uh, Rochelle and I and our girls have come to love over the last several years together. And this is our last Sunday, my last Sunday, I'm getting to share with you a little bit from the book of Ecclesiastes, actually one of my favorite um, books in the scriptures. Um, I was thinking a lot about Ecclesiastes and ending and wrapping things up while I was on a walk uh, a few weeks ago because like everybody else, like I'm getting, I'm getting older. I was on video for a church a couple of weeks ago and uh, one person said in the comments, they said, Ooh, salt and pepper beard. And I was like, oh my goodness. Like, I'm growing older. And I actually like growing older. It's funny, a couple years ago, uh, my friend Matt turned 50. And while he was getting to the point where he was turning 50, he wanted to post about what it was like for him to turn 50. Now, I remember when people used to have throw big parties when folks would turn 40. I remember as a kid, our preacher turned 40 and there was an incredible party for him and they had decorations all over the place that just said over the hill, over the hill, over the, you know, and it was, it was a great time together. And I remember thinking as a kid that 40 was old. But now at this point in life where 40 is kind of well in the uh, rear view mirror, 40 wasn't old at all. Matter of fact, I'm not the only one that's come to that conclusion because if you go to party stores, it's harder than it used to be to find stuff that says 40 and over the hill together. Now, that's a completely different age. 40 is like the new the new 30. But Matt was turning 50 and he wanted to chronicle what it was like in a humorous way for him to turn 50. So the very first day on his birthday, he posted on Facebook a picture of his recently received AARP card. And, and he just said, um, got my AARP card. Like it makes it official. And so then for the next eight days, he posted something on Facebook about turning 50. So I just wanted to like to share a couple of them with you. Um, he says, full day number one, hip still intact. Stay tuned for updates. Full day number two, Geritol laced insure for lunch. Full day number three, Chase neighborhood children out the yard with a broom. Day four, complained about the music we had at church yesterday. <laughs> Day five, switch to cable package that offers only the weather channel. Day six, shopping for dark knee socks to accessorize with long shorts and sandals. Day seven, firing off angry letter to the editor again. <laughs> Day eight, planning to make a right turn sometime this afternoon, turning on blinker now, just to be safe. <sighs> well, that's one way, I guess, to talk about growing older. I don't know anybody who's 50 who does that stuff. But I think Matt kind of points us in an important direction as we look at the book of Ecclesiastes, which is not looking forward, but looking back. And what do we want our lives to look like when we get, as we get older? Most of us just never look down the road that far. And I know for many of us, there are reasons that we don't look down the road that far. Like we're just trying to get through today. We're just trying to get through the week. But wouldn't it be wise of us to look down the road a little bit, at least try to figure out what we want to do with our lives so as we get older, we can look back and say that we did it the right way. As a matter of fact, when I'm, when I'm having counseling sessions with people, whether it's about 
uh, a marriage that's coming up or a divorce they're going through, when they're having a difficult time with their kids or a coworker, whatever it is, one of the questions that I always ask is simple. What story do you want to tell? Because here's the reality of life. In three years, five years, 10 years, what's happening today is just gonna be a story that you tell. And what story do you want to tell about the way that you behaved, the way that you spoke, how you treated people? Because eventually, this is just gonna be a story that you tell. And the beauty is that if you ask yourself, what story do I want to tell? You get to determine that before the events happen and then you are not a slave to the events and your emotions or other people's emotions in the, in the middle of it. Like what story do you wanna tell? Because that's really important. So some of you will remember the movie Saving Private Ryan and, and the scene at the cemetery where Ryan, now an old man, goes and visits the cemetery and he visits the graves of the men who died saving him. And I'm sorry if you haven't seen it, that's a spoiler, but the movie is like 15 or 20 years old. Sorry. They're at the cemetery with his wife and their children and grandchildren. He looks at his wife, looking at the graves of these men who sacrificed their lives to save him. And he asks his wife to tell him something. He says, tell me that I'm a good man. Tell me I'm a good man. And don't some of us think about that sometimes? That when we look back at our lives, that we want them to have mattered? That we've been good in some important way? And that's what Solomon wants too. And we've been walking through the book of Ecclesiastes and we've heard Solomon talk about the nature of life time and again. And what he says, what keeps coming up, is like life is vapor. It's good, it's useful, but it's quick and it's fleeting. But that leaves a huge gaping hole, doesn't it? Don't we think that there ought to be more to life on earth than just vapor? Because if that's the truth, what are we supposed to do? Everything being vapor is helpful in one sense. It teaches us not to hold on too tightly to things that don't last. And we know that no matter how much we enjoy something or how hard we work, that it'll eventually go. Our beauty will pass, our wealth will pass, our status will pass. The day will come when it all will go away. But if that's the case, why bother to get out of bed? Is it wrong to have ambition, to wanna do things, to wanna build something? And if that's the case, maybe, maybe the people who sit around all day watching reality TV, maybe those people are right. And so we live in this tension. Life is fleeting, but we know that we were designed to do something, to offer something, to bless the world, because, because when Jesus comes to earth, well, you notice about Jesus's life. Jesus doesn't sit around all day. He doesn't just say, well, it's just meaningless. And not, not at all, Jesus, in just a few years, gets a lot of stuff done. So Solomon, what are we supposed to do with this tension that we live in? And this is what the wise teacher says in Ecclesiastes 12. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Here's the most important thing. Solomon says, when you look back at life, he says, when I look back at my life, here's what I want you to know. When you're young, remember your creator. Which is the hardest thing in the world to do when you are young. Because when you're young, you're not concerned about remembering anything. You think everything in life is ahead of you. And as you want, you want to try everything, you want to taste everything, experience everything. Haven't you ever wondered why fads come and go? Like the younger you are, the more inclined you are to believe that certain things 
last. And the older you get, the more you experience that they just don't. But then on the other hand, some of us think that we're too old to be young. Well, here's the twist. Solomon isn't talking about just age. He's talking about a season in life. He's talking about a season of life when you have all of your faculties and abilities. He goes on in chapter 12 to describe what that looks like, what the days ahead of all of us look like. He says, remember your creator in the days of your youth before the days of trouble come. Before the days of trouble come. Because you know what? The days of trouble are coming. And some of us experience days of trouble when we're young and some in early adulthood and some middle age and some late in life, but the days of trouble are coming. So a friend of mine says that, that everyone is um, in the middle of a crisis, coming out of a crisis, or about to enter into a crisis. So remember your creator before the days of trouble come. Solomon doesn't say the days of trouble might come. They will come. And then he says, before the days of trouble come and the years approach when you will say, I find no pleasure in them. Do you know why you find no pleasure in the days of trouble? Because they're hard. And today is gonna be as hard as yesterday was and tomorrow doesn't look any better. Remember your creator. When all you know is crisis, every day feels like trouble. Plus, we've all known someone who deteriorated to the point that there was simply no pleasure in life. And one of the things that our family is dealing with now is that my wife, my wife Rochelle, her mother's experiencing just some deterioration, deterioration in memory. And she has no trouble remembering the days of her youth. She has trouble remembering what happened five minutes ago, 10 minutes ago, an hour ago. Solomon says, remember God before you can't remember God. Then he goes on to describe it, starting in verse two. He says, before the sun and the light and before the moon and the stars grow dark and the clouds return after the rain, when the keepers of the house tremble, when the strong men stoop, when the griders cease because they are few and those looking through the windows grow dim, when the doors to the streets are closed and the sound of grinding fades. Sound of grinding, that's a metaphor for working when that fades, when people rise up at the sound of birds, we hear them, we know that there is music, there is beauty around, but all their songs grow faint. You know the difference, right? In music, you know there's a difference between music you can hear and you know the difference between that and a song that's your song, a song that's your jam, that's a bop. Solomon says a time will come when people are afraid of heights and the dangers in the streets. That means heights and the streets. We're afraid of both the highs and the lows. There's no safe place. When the almond tree blossoms and the grasshopper drags itself along and desire no longer is stirred. When the grasshopper can't jump, when, when there's no more left in those legs, I remember Charles Barkley saying one time of basketball players, he says, you know, those knees only have so many jumps in them. That's true for all of us. There will come a time where we just can't do that anymore. Then people go to their eternal home and mourners go about in the streets that we all die. Then Solomon says, remember him, remember God before the silver cord is severed and the golden bowl is broken, before the pitcher is shattered at the spring, 
and the wheel broken at the well, and the dust returns to the ground it came from, and the spirit returns to the God who gave it. All of those, all those things that bring us life, including the spirit. Remember God before all of that deteriorates, before all of you deteriorates. The bigger picture that Solomon is painting is that everything will be broken. It will all go away, except one thing, God. So remember God when you're stressed out because you don't have as much money as you think you should have. Remember God when you're at your wit's end with your children or with your spouse. Remember God when you're sick and it feels like everything is falling apart. Remember God when your business investments and dreams don't seem to be coming together. Remember God when you're tempted to cut corners, to get ahead by doing something that you know isn't right. And there's an important but subtle nuance here. Because when the Bible talks about remembering God, it doesn't mean to remember God the same way that you might remember what you had for breakfast this morning. Remembering God is about remembering the action of God and the great acts of God. We remember God and how God has been faithful so that we can trust God to be faithful. Remembering God is about participating in the activity of God in your life and around the world. Solomon says, your life is going to be much better. You're going to make much better decisions if you center your activities on the activities of God. We remember God when we make decisions in our lives, that the activity of our lives is centered on the will of God. In John 5, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they ask him why he does all the things that he does. And he tells them, well, you know what? I just do what I see my father doing. At the end of it all, Solomon says, this is how best to spend your life. This is how Ecclesiastes 12 ends. He says, now all has been heard. We've heard it all. We've aired it all out. We've talked about everything. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the duty of all mankind. Solomon says the same thing that Jesus says later. He says, you want your life to matter? You want to have an impact in the world and on others? You want to do something that outlives you? Then you have to join God. And doesn't that make sense? Like if you want to be a part of something that lasts, wouldn't it make sense to sign on to the only thing that's everlasting? So how do you do that? So I'm going to give you three questions. They're not magical questions. They're just what I came up with. Reading through and thinking through Ecclesiastes, you might have much better questions that you have formulated. I just want to give you some handles to get started on this journey. These are the questions I ask myself. Number one, where am I spending my time, my money, and my energy because they give me an elevated sense of status? Where am I spending time, money, and energy on things that won't last just because they make me feel better, make me feel good about myself? Where are they? And then where are oppressed, hurting people that I might assist? And not just some other place in the world or not just for a week, a year or whatever, and not that those are bad things, but where are people that I can come and walk alongside? So a couple of years ago, I decided to take seriously what Jesus says in Luke 4 about freedom of prisoners. And I started working with a ministry here in Houston called Restoring Justice. And it works to bring reform in our prison system. And there are lots of reforms that need to happen that almost every Christian in the world would get behind if they knew that they were happening. And it's a Christian organization because I can do that every week, every month, every year. Where are there oppressed, hurting people that I might be able to assist? And third, how am I leveraging my work, my career, my gifts, my vocation that God has given me how am I leveraging my work and my work relationships to bring others to God? And people think that's easy for a preacher. Preachers have less leverage to bring people outside of the church to God than people who work outside of the church. Where's that happening? 
And how do I engage with that? If someone were to ask my neighbors, my physical neighbors, does Sean love you? Like God has asked Sean to love his neighbors. Like, has he done that? That's the question. Because if I wanna do something meaningful, if you wanna do something meaningful, if you wanna do something that lasts forever, it has to be connected to the only thing that's everlasting. Bama, let me pray for you. God, give us a sense of everlasting to everlasting as you say you are in Ecclesiastes and how we partner with you to bring about your glorious kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Give us vigor and energy and stamina and patience and endurance. God, that you would make us more kind to one another in our churches and around the world, that we would um, be less fragile and offended so that we could be about your business from everlasting to everlasting. And we ask it in Jesus' name, amen.